Well, I'd first like to uh, thank all of you for joining us um, for this year's Stalker Day event. Uh, I'm really glad to be a part of this event, albeit in a much different format than what we are all accustomed to. Today, I'm going to be sharing some of my thoughts on making alternative rationing ingredient changes work. Um, you know, recently, the situation we found ourselves in this spring uh, due to the pandemic, we saw some very dramatic changes in the availability of, of some of our commodities, uh, principally wet distillers grains and, and some of the other byproducts. And, and so it really created some challenges for us in terms of what we might be able to utilize in uh, many of our rations in, in place of those ingredients. And so I think there's certainly a renewed interest in alternative ration ingredients and how we might put some of those to, to work in our operations for us. Now, as I think about alternative ingredients, they really come in two types of, uh, two types or two flavors. You know, the first one of those would be what I would consider to be common feedstuffs, but they're not our first choice for some reason. They may be less desirable. Um, you know, we think of that in some cases, it's, it's just simply cost. If we consider soybean meal or whole soybeans, those are certainly commodities that can be used in a cattle ration, but oftentimes they're more expensive. And so they're not the most economical choice for us to use in that ration. Another common feed stuff in this category would be grain screenings or grain dust. Um, certainly a, a very common, easily accessible feed stuff, but the variability uh, and maybe some other issues associated with it may make it less attractive for a producer to use. The second, you know, flavor of an alternative ingredient that we run across, and, and really for me, these are sometimes pretty exciting to take a look at, or what I would consider to be the more uncommon ingredients. These would be things like bakery waste or vegetable or produce waste, um, you know, that may be coming out of uh, maybe grocery store waste or simply stuff that they can't get off the shelf fast enough. And so it, there's another alternative or another endpoint for some of those products that, that could be used. Now, as I look at inclusion of an alternative ingredient, really I have two goals. My first goal is that I'm gonna to try to match the current ration in terms of its nutrient composition as, as well as the palatability of that ration. And we also need to, to be sensitive to cost and making sure that we're, those changes that we're making are, are to our advantage from an economic standpoint. The, the second goal is we also need to successfully transition the cattle onto that ration. And, you know, to me, it's, it's really about dry matter intake. And from a very simple standpoint, dry matter intake on cattle equals nutrient intake, which directly equals cattle performance. So we have to get intake into those cattle to, to achieve a, acceptable levels of, of performance on those uh, calves. So for me, one of the, the essential pieces of information that, that we really need on an operation to evaluate or to begin considering the inclusion of an alternative ingredient is we need to know what your current ration is. When in terms of that formulation, what's the recipe? What's the recipe of ingredients that is going into the bunk? If we're gonna to try to match that, we need to know how many pounds of silage, we need to know how many pounds or percentage of wet distillage grains is going into that ration and be able to replicate that on a daily basis. The other piece of that is having some idea of what the nutrient analysis of that bunk is. What's the chemical composition? And there's really two key pieces of information here. We'd like to have some idea of what the numbers look like of the ration that's delivered in the bunk. This effectively gives the nutritionist uh, a, a target to work from. You know, where are your energy levels currently at? How much protein are you supplying in that ration? The other area where we do need a little bit of information is, is often on the commodities. What's the nutrient analysis of the commodities that we're using? Uh, this is really information that we're going to use to hit that target. But, so if you think of it as hitting a target and then intel that's going to, or intelligence and information that we're going to be able to use to hit that target in terms of those ras ration specifications. Now, in some cases, we may not necessarily need to test all of our commodities. Um, you know, take, for example, corn. If we're simply using rolled corn, is it really worth us to, to some, do an analysis on that? Not necessarily, but if we consider forages, which are going to be the most variable, those are ones where we've really got to have some essential information to be able to, to build that ration. So we also have to move maybe a little bit deeper uh, into that nutrient analysis and the composition of what's in the bunk. You know, if we think about 20 pounds of feed in the bunk, what does that equate to? 
Well, from a chemical standpoint or the nutrient composition standpoint, it's seven and a half pounds of water. It may be around two pounds of crude protein and about 11 megacals of energy. On the other side of that, if we look at our commodities, what's actually in a ton of wet distillers grain? So there's about 1,300 pounds of water, 217 pounds of crude protein, 42 pounds of fat, and 665 megacals of energy in that ton of wet distillers grain. So it's that piece of information allows us to look a little bit deeper in terms of what's in that bunk. And when we put that information together with the information that we're going to gather on these alternative commodities, it really allows us to do a much better job of, of being able to hit those targets in terms of matching that current feeding program. So the other thing that ties into this is how do we evaluate alternative ingredients? You know, here's really two examples of what I considered, you know, the common feedstuffs and then the true uncommon feedstuff that we can feed the cattle with the vegetable produce waste shown here on the left. On the right, we have this is essentially just a big pile of corn screenings. Um, so you can see there what that would, would kind of look like. So once again, coming back to the nutrient analysis and getting an idea of what this stuff that we're looking at putting in this ration really is. Over here on the right, there's a nutrient analysis on some bakery meal. Uh, you can look at the specifications on it. And what we need to consider as we look at the nutrient analysis is, in your ration, what would this ingredient replace, okay? If we look at this bakery analysis, it's about 13% crude protein, 88% dry matter, um, if we look at the net energy for maintenance numbers, net energy for gain, et cetera, you know, that's what's in, you know, what is this really going to do? The other piece of that is, what do you need in your ration? Are you looking for an additional energy source? Are you maybe looking for a protein source? The nutrient analysis also allows us to begin to compare this particular feed stuff to other feeds that we're more familiar with. What's the cost or value of this product relative to, to, to corn. Um, the other side of that is we can also do those cost per unit of energy and cost per unit of, of protein calculations that, that we're very accustomed to doing as we price other commodities into our rations. There's also some important questions that we, we need to consider as well. Many of these are not going to be listed on the, the nutrient analysis that we would get when we're looking at some sort of an alternative ingredient. For example, what's the physical form of the ingredient. Well, we see some indications here in this report, the bakery meal. So we start thinking, well, it's probably a very finely ground product. The other question is I start to ask suppliers is, you know, how is this product handled? Uh, is it something that we can auger? Uh, other important questions, you know, how is this product going to be stored? Um, can we effectively store it in a bin? Does it need to be stored in a commodity bay? Those are also important questions that we're not going to get a whole lot of information on in that typical nutrient analysis, but they are important questions as we begin considering how we're going to handle uh, maybe this alternative ingredient on our operation. Now, the, the criteria that I use for evaluating alternative ingredients really isn't any different uh, for the most part from the process or the criteria that I would use for evaluating any ingredient that we're going to put into a ration. The, the first place that I'm going to start is I'm going to look at the dry matter content. We always want to evaluate any potential commodity coming into a ration on a dry matter basis. That allows us to make an apples to apples comparison. We can remove the water. We can look at either a really wet ingredient or a dry ingredient. But if we put them on a dry basis, then we're making an accurate comparison between the, the uh, components of those two ration. The moisture content also impacts the freight, you know, how much water are we hauling if this, is a, if, if this is a wet ingredient? How much dry matter are we actually getting per ton? It also can have a significant impact on both the storage um, characteristics as well as the shelf life and how the, how the product overall handles. So the dry matter is always the number one place to start. The second place that I look is what's the energy and protein content on a dry matter basis of this particular ingredient? Um, those are the two big things that we're after. We need energy and we need protein coming into those rations, and that's typically what we're going to be shopping for. The third thing that I, I give some consideration to is that many of these alternative feedstuffs have disproportionate nutrient concentrations. So I start to look for those things in the analysis. 
Um, you know, a lot of times we'll see higher fat concentrations. We may also see changes in the mineral concentrations, you know, where we see elevated levels of phosphorus. If we consider the byproducts that we're very familiar with in terms of wet distillers, grains, corn, gluten feed, they're the byproduct of a process. Well, many of these um, alternative ingredients that we, we might be interested in incorporating into a ration are also going to be a byproduct of some sort of process or have been through some sort of process, which is either, you know, concentrated some nutrients and reduced the levels of others. And so we may have to make some considerations in our rations, uh, adjustments uh, in, the, in, our, in our programs. Um, the other factor that sometimes uh, can be an issue is the presence of anti-nutritional factors. Uh, aflatoxins are a big one. You know, I mentioned grain dust is one of those alternative ingredients that sometimes we get the opportunity to use or screenings. In many cases, if we have any sort of toxins that are gonna be present in the grain, those are going to be increased in, in the screenings or, or the dust that's coming out of that elevator that we might be getting the, that product from. You know, my fourth criteria that, that I give some consideration to is, you know, how will this ingredient react in the rumen? This is those factors like particle size. What's the solubility? You know, are we dealing with, is this a starch source? What's the solid, you know, the fiber uh, aspect of that, as well as the protein, you know, how is this really going to, to react in the rumen? You know, the fifth it gets a little deeper. Again, we need to look at the, and consider the fiber fraction, more specifically the NDF. Uh, you know, what's the physically effective fiber? And the way that I try to encourage people to think about this, you know, we need fiber to be physically effective in the rations. And so not all the NDF is created equal. Even with our common feedstuffs, if we consider the, the, the NDF fraction that's in hay versus silage versus wet distillers grains, those NDF fractions are, they're all NDF, but they're very different in terms of the type. Obviously in a long stemmed hay, we're gonna get more physically effective uh, fiber, have a higher percentage of physically effective fiber in that hay versus the, the same NDF that's going to be in the wet distillers grains. Um, that's just really, it, it comes back down to the, the old term scratch factor maybe really applies. That's a pretty good um, way to describe what physically effective fiber would mean. So as we get into kind of some guidelines on ration formulation and alternative ingredients. So if we think about those, those common alternative feedstuffs that, that are alternative in, ingredients, you know, most of the time, the inclusion of those type of products is, is going to be limited by cost or the nutrient profile, and in some cases, maybe some anti-nutritional concerns. You know, those are those, you know, they are, you know, they're, certain, they're a grain, they're a commodity, but there's something that makes them, they might be more expensive, which is going to limit them on the cost side or something else. As we get into those less common alternative ingredients, those true alternative ingredients, you know, my general recommendation on ration inclusion of those type of ingredients would be to target a level somewhere between 10 and 30% of the ration on a dry matter basis. You know, this is really for two reasons. One, a lot of those type of ingredients, we know there's going to be some nutrient variability. And so if we include those ingredients at a fairly low level of the ration, that limits the impact of that variability on that total uh, ration. The other aspect of that is oftentimes there's some supply concerns or supply and logistics issues. You know, how frequent can we get a load of this particular product in? Um, and with that being said, we also need to have a plan B. If for some reason we can't source that ingredient, you know, can we reduce the inclusion of it pretty dramatically or can we replace it with something else in the ration without greatly impacting the overall total of the ration? So that's one of the reasons, you know, I try to keep those levels or would recommend that we, we use fair, fairly low levels uh, in the overall ration of those type of ingredients. So I wanted to also look at a couple of different diet examples. Uh, so I put together a, a simple grower ration. Um, hypothetical, you know, if we look at a, a ration here that's that's basically 25% prairie hay, alfalfa, wet distillers grains, and rolled corn, 25% uh, of each of those ingredients, we'd come up with a ration that's around 63% dry matter, 
really close to 15% protein, have about 0.72 megacals of, of energy, and, and be around 4.2% 4, 4 fat. So what would that ration look like if we utilize a fairly low inclusion, say 10% of, of corn screenings or grain screenings? Uh, so we do 25, 25, 25, 15, and, and 10. So that the screenings are essentially replacing some of the rolled corn that's in that ration. If we look at the, the nutrient analysis on, <clears throat> on that ration, dry matter essentially stays the same, crude protein really the same. There's essentially no difference between that. So this is one of those kind of classic scenarios where because of the chemical composition or the nutrient content of those screenings, which are going to be 95, 98% that similar to corn, we can include 10% of those in the ration with, with relatively low impact on the overall total nutrient composition of that ration. Could we foreseeably look at a situation where we might replace all of the corn in that ration if the supply of the screens was, you know, one uh, of good enough quality that we could do that and we, we were able to secure a sufficient supply that we felt comfortable doing that? Yeah, absolutely. We certainly probably could look at doing something like that and that would present it as, as an option. So, so here's another uh, example. Uh, this one is, is really takes um, some inspiration from how we address the scenario this spring where we saw the decreased availability of wet distillage grains. So the same grower ration is, is shown on the left. And now we've replaced the wet distillage grains with some whole soybeans and some alfalfa. You see here the prairie hay is at 15%. Alfalfa increases to 38% on a dry matter basis. We include 10% of whole beans um, and then 37% rolled corn, which is a, a bit of an increase there to, to really keep the energy density the same. As we look at the dry matter composition of that ration, here's some changes, right? Okay, as we go from 63 to now, we've got a much drier ration due to the, the, the replacing the wet distillage grains. Our crude protein, our energy estimates are really right in line with uh, where they were previously. So what has also changed is the fat content. If we think about those whole soybeans, having somewhere in the neighborhood of more than 20% uh, fat content, the addition of those is going to increase that, the fat content of that ration. Now, is it at a level where we would have some concerns? You know, anytime we go above 4% in a growing ration on a dry matter basis, you know, that's certainly something we need to take a look at. Is it excessive? Not at this level, but that fat number does limit the amount of those beans that we could you potentially utilize in this ration. So there's just a couple of different a couple of different examples of using some different ingredients where we've got similar protein, similar energy levels, and how those rations might change as we begin to, to put more uh, of those ingredients uh, that would be considered alternative uh, back into those rations. So the second goal is we have to be able to successfully transition those cattle to a new ration. And if we're going to use some alternative ingredients, we're going to make some diet transitions in there. And so, you know, how do we set our ourselves up for success to be able to do that? And I think this, the concept, you know, diet transitions and, and just how we make those and the concepts behind that, you know, it creates some anxiety for producers. Um, and I think sometimes we forget the cattle are very robust creatures. Um, you know, the rumen in itself is a large mixing vessel from a very simplistic standpoint. It's certainly not an all in, all out type system. We have feedstuffs that are rapidly degraded. We have others that are not. And, and part of the the job of a nutritionist is understanding, you know, how feeds are going to be degraded in the rumen and how they're going to react in the rumen. And so, you know, yes, you know, it is unfortunate where we do have some cattle during a diet transition that may go off feed, but as a general rule, a lot of times cattle can, we can make those transitions and, and get along relatively well. So I wanted to offer, you know, kind of some, some insights and, and guidelines into managing diet transitions. As a general rule, cattle will generally consume approximately the same amount of dry matter or, or calories per day. And so one of the keys to being able to manage cattle through diet transition is if we know cattle intake. If I know how much feed a, a set of calves is consuming, I can calculate their dry matter as well as their energy intake and then make my ration adjustments on that basis. So if my new ration, contains a similar energy content, 
all we're really adjusting is feed delivery. That's one of the reasons that, that I often recommend trying to match the ration that those cattle are, are currently consuming as we include that, especially in terms of the energy levels, uh, as we you know, look at including an alternative ingredients. We're, all we're doing here is we're providing the same nutrients, but in a different amount of feed. And so we got the same energy density. We know the dry matter is probably gonna shift a little bit on us. And so all we're doing is doing that dry matter to as fed conversion and, and kind of addressing that with the cattle. So let's, let's work through a bit of an example. So if we have some calves that are consuming 18 pounds of regrower ration, that's 70% dry matter and contains 0.7 megacals per pound. Pretty typical grower ration. So if we do the dry matter, that's 12 and a half pounds of dry feed per day. So that feed is supplying 9.4 megacals per day of energy to those calves. So if the new ration is 80% dry matter, has a similar energy content, okay? That 12 and a half pounds of dry matter, if we divide that by 0.8, that dry matter to as fed conversion, it's gonna take 15.6 pounds of feed to supply the same amount of dry matter because that ration is drier. If we kind of do the check, do the 12 and a half times 0.75, we get that same energy density. So if our diet is similar with no major ingredient changes, okay, meaning we, you know, we've just, that example where we dropped in the corn screens, didn't really change the composition of that ration at, at all, going to feed very similar. There might be some differences in terms of the, the grind size on the corn, uh, but by and large, it's a very small uh, change to that ration at a lower inclusion level. I'm going to offer 98% of the target. So of that 15.6 pounds, I'm going to offer those cattle 15.3 pounds uh, to start off with. Now, often in diet transitions, you know, we have to make some judgment calls. If those calves, if there's some issue due to weather or other factors, we can adjust that consumption down. That's just a good benchmark is to start is to offer about 2% less than what those cattle were currently consuming on a dry matter basis. So what if we have made some major ingredient changes? And I would define that as any time we've changed more than 40% of that ration. So in that particular scenario, I'm gonna offer about 90 to 95% of that target on the first feeding, and then maybe step those cattle up two to 3% per day. My end game is I'd like to have those cattle back up to the same level of dry matter intake or the target consumption of dry matter intake in four days if possible really trying to limit the amount of time and making sure that we're getting adequate consumption of nutrients into those cattle so that we don't give up any performance in the long term of the feeding period. So there's also another way that we can, you know, manage a diet transition. You know, we just, in previous slides, we talked about kind of that abrupt transition where we go from the old diet to the new diet and how we might offer those diets. The other method that we can utilize to make a diet transition is blending rations in the bunk. This is where we're going to feed um, a portion of the dry matter uh, intake for the day from the old ration and a portion of the dry matter intake from the new ration. Typically on a grower ration, I'll start at 60% of the old ration uh, and 40% of the new ration on the first day. If we take that 12 and a half pounds of dry matter intake from our example, 60% uh, of that would be seven and a half pounds of dry feed from the, the old ration, five pounds from the new ration. On an as-fed basis, due to the, to the moisture content of those feeds, that would be 10.7 pounds of the old ration and 6.25 pounds or six and a quarter pounds of the new ration. Total as-fed feed intake for the day is gonna be 16.95 pounds, okay? Second day, I would go to 50-50, uh, which you can see the numbers there. The third day I'd be at 40-60, so majority of the day's um, uh, feeding is starting to come from the new ration by day three, and by day four we could effectively switch those cattle over to the new ration completely. Now on an operation where, those, where we feed once per day, uh, typically I would start with the old ration, make a second batch of feed of the new ration, and put that out on top. If we're in a situation where we feed twice per day, a lot of times we'll feed the old ration in the morning and the new ration in the afternoon. Um, there, there's really no set guidelines of, of how we do this. Um, this is um, blending rations in the bunk is commonly done in the, in the cattle feeding industry where we have feed yards that may only have two rations in a two ration system. We'll have a starter ration and we'll have a finisher ration. A lot of times they'll make much smaller incremental changes than what we've 
can do on these grower rations. But these are some numbers that, that have worked uh, very well that I often give to producers. It's, it's kind of a guideline in terms of how to make these diet transitions and, and blend rations in the bunk. So some additional thoughts on diet transitions. You know, cattle can be held at any point in the transition. If we're doing a, a two ration blend in the bunk and you're at that 50-50 step and it just seems like that we need to hold those cattle there for whatever reason, um, you know, that's, that's perfectly fine. We can hold them there for, for as, as long as we need to. Um, you know, there's, there's some instances where we may offer those calves 12 pounds of dry matter intake and, and they may give us two pounds back the next morning in the bunk. You know, if the easiest way to, to hit the reset button on a set of cattle is essentially just to, to back the intakes down or, or hold them about the same. You know, typically um, takes us about two to three days to, to reset those cattle. And, but there's really no harm in, in going slower and then increasing the feed delivery at, at the later point. A lot of times we'll be further ahead than if we try to get ahead of those cattle initially. So some general, as I kind of start to wrap things up, I wanted to give some general guidelines on, you know, how do we make alternative ingredients work and, and what are some key things that we need to have in place. And I think the first one of those is we really need to be an operation that, that knows what you're feeding. What are you putting in the bunk? What's the chemical composition of those commodities that are going in the bunk so that we can uh, do a really good job of, of putting the alternative ingredient in there, kind of matching your feeding program and, and making it fit. As we look at the alternative ingredients themselves, it's essential that we get a nutrient analysis. It's really impossible for us to evaluate those ingredients without it. Um, the other piece that we've, we've got to give some consideration to is there may be some handling issues or some other concerns that we may need to, to address with an alternative um, ingredient. In terms of making the transition on the cattle, documenting where cattle are, what are cattle intakes at? What are those cattle actually eating? That's really important, a really important piece of information in terms of strategically moving those cattle into the diet transitions. And, and cattle do handle diet transitions relatively well. I, I do think we just need to be strategic about how we do it and, and really have a plan in place. And if we do those things, um, you know, there's, there's endless possibilities in terms of utilizing some alternative ingredients with, within a feeding program. I mean, I honestly, I think um, for myself and, and maybe a lot of people involved in the cattle feeding industry, my two favorite words are free and feed or low cost feed. And so many of these alternative ingredients certainly present some opportunities. We do have to look at them, take a closer look at what the chemical composition of those ingredients are and then go about putting them in the ration in a way that's, that's going to uh, transition those cattle successfully so that we don't give up uh, any animal performance uh, with those new ingredients or new commodities uh, coming into the ration. So thanks for uh, tuning in with us uh, for this year's Stalker Day. It was certainly a pleasure to be a part of it. Thanks again.